It's clear that America is becoming increasingly divided, and if we remain on the path we're on, things are only going to get worse. There will be more aggression in the streets, more gridlock in Washington, and that's really just the beginning of how bad things can get. So if we truly want to make America great, then we have to make a conscious effort to heal the division. And we have to do it soon, because if the division gets too severe, there may be a point of no return. So how do we fix this division problem? Well, you can't really fix a problem until you understand it. So in this video, I'm going to explain exactly why and how Donald Trump is using fear to divide America based on insights from neuroscience and psychology. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it because it's important to address it directly and accurately. When we examine what's going on through the lens of science, everything that's happening right now, as bizarre as it all seems, will make a whole lot of sense. Also, when we understand the mechanics of the current chaos, we'll start to see the potential solutions. I want to get right into that, but I know that when you talk about science on the internet, people want to know your credentials. So, my name is Bobby Azarian, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, a freelance journalist, and a blogger for Psychology Today. A lot of my research has to do with how we respond to threat and how fear can bias our behavior and distort our perception of the world. Based on the reasoning I'm about to describe, in 2016, I was able to predict the rise of Donald Trump and the growing nationalist movement that has swept much of rural America. It really boils down to fear. Fear is the great divider and Donald Trump is using it as a strategic tool to polarize America, which helps him because it energizes his base and adds momentum to the Trump movement. And as we'll learn, by doing this, he's also pushing Democrats further to the left, which gives him a better chance with moderates, libertarians, and independents. So by letting the nation become increasingly polarized, we're playing right into his hands. You might be thinking, it's no real secret that Donald Trump uses fear, but the story is a bit more complicated than that and a lot more interesting. To really understand the effects of fear, we gotta become familiar with something called terror Terror Management Theory. Terror Management Theory, which is based on a Pulitzer Prize winning book from the 70s called The Denial of Death, is supported by hundreds of psychology and neuroscience studies. According to the theory, human behavior is largely driven by our awareness of our own mortality. Unlike other animals, we know that death is inevitable and can occur at any moment for reasons beyond our control. This realization leads to an existential fear that is always bubbling beneath the surface. To mitigate this fear, humans created cultural worldviews like religions, political ideologies, and national identities. These worldviews make us feel safe by providing paths to immortality. Through the concept of an afterlife, religions offer literal immortality, while political ideologies and national identities give us symbolic immortality. In other words, they make us feel like we're part of a group and a movement that will outlive the individual. So in summary, Terror management theory says that worldviews protect us from our fear of death, this existential terror that is deep down in all of us. If this theory is true, then making people think about their own mortality should cause them to strengthen their worldviews. Additionally, death reminders should make us more supportive of people who share our worldviews and more aggressive towards people who hold opposing worldviews. Simply put, existential fear should promote tribalism and ideological extremism, and that's exactly what the studies have shown. For example, one study weaponized hot sauce to measure the effects of death reminders on a aggression toward ideological opponents. Students were broken into two groups and asked to write an essay about their own death or a control topic. They were then presented with someone that did or did not disparage their political views and were asked to decide on the amount of mouth-burning hot sauce the disparager would have to consume. In line with terror management theory, participants who were made to think about their own mortality allocated twice as much hot sauce to those who belittled their worldview. Unfortunately, the effects of terror management theory go beyond wishing your ideological opponent a burning mouth. A 2006 study found that Iranian students who were given death reminders became more supportive of terror attacks against the U.S. while those Iranians in the controlled condition opposed them. In a similar way, mortality triggers made American students who identified as politically conservative more supportive of extreme military attacks on foreign nations that would kill thousands of civilians. From these studies, it's easy to see how people who feel like they're under attack can quickly grow hostile toward those from outside cultures. For countries that are multicultural, perceived existential threat can sow division incredibly fast. In fact, a number of studies have shown that making mortality salient can amplify nationalism and intensify racial bias. So how do these experiments line up with reality? Well, let's see. Donald Trump stoked existential fears over and over with statements like this. Do you think Islam is at war with the West? I think Islam hates us. There's something, there's something there that there's a tremendous hatred there. There's a tremendous hatred. We have to get to the bottom of it. There is an unbelievable the hatred of us. And this. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. And this. ISIS is honoring President Obama. He is the founder of ISIS. He's the founder of ISIS. He's the founder. He founded ISIS. So his supporters were willing to excuse or ignore comments like this. Hey, when you're a star, they let you do it. 
You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the pussy. And this. Yeah, that's it, with the gold. I gotta use some Tic Tacs just in case I start kissing her. Politically, surviving that video is not normal. Remember how this single moment in 2004 ruined Howard Dean, who was up until that point favored to become the Democratic nominee? And then we're going to Washington, D.C. to take back the White House! Yeah! Seems hard to believe now, right? So Donald Trump has positioned himself as the great protector of white Christian America after convincing them that existential threat was on their doorstep. And when these people bolster their worldviews, they feel like, hey, this guy's on my team. Some fundamentalists literally believe he's their savior sent as an answer to prayers. This is where things can get really dangerous because the Messiah is infallible. That's how a cult's created, with members that will follow their leader off a cliff. And Trump understands how strange and powerful this unconditional loyalty is. He even explained it to his supporters. And you know what else they say about my people? The polls. They say, I have the most loyal people. Did you ever see that? where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. It's like he's using some Jedi mind trick on him, but all that it is is fear. We can be sure of this because the 2017 study conducted by the co-founder of Terror Management Theory found that mortality reminders directly increase support for Trump. The same study found that these participants viewed immigrants moving into their neighborhood as an existential threat. So there's a pretty simple story here. Fear strengthens support for leaders with nationalist messages. Those nationalist messages create more fear. And a dangerous feedback loop is established that leads to a sort of mass hysteria, which makes followers unconditionally loyal to their leader. Donald Trump is both a symptom and a cause. The same effect occurred when George Bush had a spike in popularity after 9-11. This was investigated with another terror management study, which confirmed the relationship between existential fear and increased support for Bush. In light of the research, there should be little doubt whether the global nationalist surge we're currently experiencing, which fueled the Brexit movement and the rise of Donald Trump, is in many ways the result of the existential terror created by ISIS and increasing cultural fears over immigration. It's equally certain that the emergence of Islamic terror groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda were largely a result of the ongoing chaos in the Middle East and its occupation by outside military forces like the U.S. Army. When existential threat looms, it creates a sweeping psychological condition that sets the stage for waves of both religious fundamentalist and far-right nationalist movements that encourage prejudice, intolerance, and hostility toward outside groups. But fear is not just affecting the right in this country. The perceived existential threat posed by Trump and his nationalist ideology has undoubtedly pushed many liberals toward more extreme positions. America has seen the rise of the militant left-wing group known as Antifa, whose tactics have grown increasingly violent in confrontations with the alt-right. Liberals, understandably afraid of the growing white supremacist movement, have become less tolerant of anyone not clearly on their side, and more sympathetic to hostile behavior toward Trump supporters. Terror management theory predicts that liberals who feel their worldview is under threat will enforce their left-wing norms more strongly than usual. While this might seem like a positive thing on the surface, given that liberal ideals are traditionally inclusive and aimed at achieving equality, a 2017 study published in the Journal of Social and Political Psychology found that the over-enforcement of PC norms directly increased support for Donald Trump. And when we start calling for censorship, restrictions on free speech, and banning books perceived to be offensive, we gradually begin to look a lot like the authoritarianism that we're supposed to be against. So it doesn't seem to matter what ideological side it occurs on, polarization appears to be intrinsically bad for society. Not to mention it helps Trump. The Russians know this better than anyone, and it's exactly what motivated their online social engineering efforts. If we don't depolarize the nation, then we're straight up giving Trump a better chance of getting reelected. So what do we do about it? How do we break the self-amplifying cycle where fear leads to aggression and aggression leads to more fear? Besides just making a conscious effort to chill out and ignore the trolls and to keep a constructive dialogue open with the other side, there's something else we can do. And in theory, it's really simple. If terror management theory is correct, then there's a way to ease the division and it has everything to do with the worldview we choose to hold. Let me explain what I mean by this. I was involved with the terror management study that was a collaboration between George George Mason University and researchers in China, and that study turned up some surprising and enlightening results. We had expected that making Chinese participants think about death would cause them to more harshly punish Koreans who treated them unfairly during an economic game. But instead of the expected national and ethnic bias, the opposite occurred. Mortality reminders actually reversed the bias, such that Chinese participants were more benevolent toward the Koreans than they were in the control condition. So how do we explain these results in light of terror management theory? It turns out our study wasn't the first to find this effect. Based on previous literature, we believe that making people think about their own mortality reduced discrimination and promoted benevolence because of the particular nature of the cultural worldview of the participants. 
Eastern cultures often put more emphasis on social ties, and there's the concept of the interdependent self, which views the individual as fundamentally embedded in a larger social world. Therefore, it's likely that under certain conditions, Eastern cultural groups defend themselves from existential threat by accepting and supporting others. Also in our study, all the participants were females, and men and women are thought to defend against threat differently. While males are generally motivated to show strength and independence, Females often focus on showing concern and care for others. Additionally, existential threat may have motivated the Chinese participants to see the Koreans only as Asians, focusing on their similarities rather than their differences. These findings show that how we choose to deal with our fear critically depends on our cultural worldview. If the worldview emphasizes a sense that we're all in this together, then existential threat can actually motivate compassion and unity. You see, the problem is that our most popular cultural worldviews, the major religions, political ideologies and national identities divide us into tribes and emphasize our differences rather than our similarities and shared human interests. And they turn neighbors into spiritual and ideological enemies. The obvious solution is a new cultural and political worldview that unites us under a common existential goal. The continued survival, progress, and eventually the outward expansion of humanity. The real existential threat is nuclear war, climate change, unconstrained AI, and the increasing centralization of wealth and power. These are things that threaten the entire human race. So we have to align our interests, and we do that by adopting a worldview that I call the cosmic perspective. Under the cosmic perspective, there's no us versus them, there's only we. We're all part of an interdependent whole, and the sooner we realize that, the better. We also need leaders who understand this worldview, who make decisions and policy based on data, who put empiricism above rigid ideology and dogma, and who try to achieve the greatest good for the greatest number of people. I'm going to talk more about the cosmic perspective in future videos, but before I go, I'd like to leave you with something to ponder. A recent study that surveyed over 600 people found that psychedelic experiences, which dissolve one's ego and ideological framework, reliably shifted people's political beliefs and attitudes toward ones that were more classically liberal. Specifically, individuals became more opposed to authoritarianism and more concerned with the well-being of others and of nature. So things like scientific progress and higher states of consciousness bring us closer to the cosmic perspective by emphasizing the interconnected nature of our society and our biosphere. Things are certainly chaotic right now, but for new levels of order to emerge, there first needs to be some chaos in the system. Could America be undergoing what physicists and complexity scientists call a phase transition, a leap to greater order and organization? The great cosmology and science educator Carl Sagan said, A religion, old or new, that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by conventional faiths. Sooner or later, such a religion will emerge. Similarly, Albert Einstein said, The religion of the future will be a cosmic religion. It will transcend a personal God and avoid dogmas and theology. Religion is a loaded term, but a spiritual ideology that is guided by science and aided by technology, that has a universal morality and a shared existential goal, will be the worldview of the future. It has to be if we want our civilization to survive. How fast we get there is entirely up to us. We get to choose between extinction and transcendence, but we have every reason to work towards the latter and away from the former. Subscribe to this channel if you're interested in topics that lie at the intersection of science, technology, culture, and philosophy. Free of pseudoscience and fake news, and full of cutting edge topics like AI, consciousness, the origins of life, the emergence of complexity, the technological singularity, and decentralization. Also, follow me on Twitter at Bobby Azarian, sign up for my mailing list on my website, and feel free to comment below as long as you're not a troll or a Russian pretending to be a Trump supporter. All right? Yeah. Uh -huh.